بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مذل له ومن يذلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أستك الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ظلالة وكل ظلالة في النار أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers so we just continue on from where we left off and uh, the sheikh he was going through if you remember he was going through the uh, the five pillars and the, uh, of Islam and the meanings and we reached uh, point 40 as you can see here point 40 is written in Arabic numerals yeah point 40 and we arrived to the part where the Sheikh is going to begin uh, with regards to fasting so fasting so then the Sheikh he says الصيام لا يجب إلا على المسلمين أما الكفار لو فعلوه ما صح منهم حتى يشهدوا أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمدا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما داموا على الكفر فإنهم لا تنفعهم الإبادات لا صيام ولا غير صيام ولذلك خاتب بهم المؤمنين خاصة لأنهم هم الذين يستجيبون وهم الذين يصح منهم الصيام ويقبل منهم الصيام. So then the Sheikh begins the next part of the explanation of the five pillars. We move on to a siyam, uh, fasting. So the Sheikh he says here in this paragraph that we just read in Arabic, he says that fasting is not obligatory except upon the Muslims. He says as for the kuffar or the disbelievers. Then, even if they did it, i.e., they fasted, it wouldn't be accepted from them basically, up until they testify that none has the worthy, uh, none has, none has the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah. None is worthy of worship in truth except Allah until they testify that, and and also until they testify that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the messenger and servant of Allah. So up until they don't make those two testifications, then even if they fasted, they wouldn't really benefit from it. It's not accepted from them and it's not correct for them to do it. So the Sheikh says, so as, so, so, so long as they are upon their disbelief, then it, this worship of fasting does not benefit them. Nor does it benefit, or, uh, or nor does it, nor does any other type of worship benefit them. And the Sheikh says for that reason that Allah mentioned in the Quran, which we're going to read the ayah, inshallah, we'll read the ayahs at the top of the page. We will go back to it. Uh, regarding that the Siyam fasting has been obligated upon the Muslims. Right? And it isn't accepted from other than them, except that the Muslim and then they fast and it's accepted. So then, the Sheikh he mentions here, he says, Kutiba alaykum siyam So he, 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 st- he starts to explain this ayah. So let's just read the whole ayah. Um, if you just go to Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 183. It's a long ayah, so I think we'll, let's just read all of it. Um, let me go to 183. Well, there's this ayah here and there's a longer one. So uh, we'll, we'll read the one that I mentioned here. 183. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum usiyamu kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattakoon. And the meaning of that, O you who believe, observing the fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you, that you may become al-mutakoon, the pious. So that's clear for us and so the sheikh he says here at the bottom of the page if you just go to the bottom here the last paragraph 
He says, Kutiba alaykum usiyam. That um, from the ayah, that fasting has been obligated upon us. It's an obligation for us. Allah has obligated it upon us. And the Shaykh, he says, Ma'na kutiba furida mithlu qawli ta'ala kutiba alaykum al-qital. Ya'ni furida alaykum al-qital fal kutub fi kitab Allah ma'nahu al-fard. So then the Shaykh, he gives us a benefit uh, uh, here, a general one, specific to what we're talking about also generally. So he says that, what does kutiba mean here? The Shaykh says kutiba means furida. And meaning that's an obligation. Like how we say, like in, in Urdu, for example, they say farz, same word, fard, obligation, okay? Obligation for, for those who know Urdu, yeah, Urdu. Or otherwise, uh, we'll explain that in English. And then the Shaykh says, like the speech of Allah, kutiba alaykum al kitab, from Surah Al Baqarah, verse 216, like it has been written for you or obligated upon you, i.e., fighting to defend yourselves, for example. Meaning, so kutiba, when it comes like this, it means furida, which we've learned, means um, obligated upon you. So this is what the Shaykh has given us the extra benefit here. So let's continue. Then the Shaykh mentions, Kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum. Kama furida ala ladina min qablikum min al umami fadalla ala anna siyama kana ma'roofan in the umami sabiqa. وفي الشرايع القديمة ولم يختص به شريعة محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. So then the Sheikh mentions, he says, كما كتب للذين من قبلكم from the speech of Allah, uh, as were those before you, it was obligated upon those before you. So the Sheikh says that fasting, it was obligated to the nations previous to the nation of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. So it isn't anything new. It's a, it's a well-known thing. Fasting is well-known. Um, and it is well-known in other uh, uh, legislations that came before the legislation that the Prophet ﷺ received from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Shaykh gives us that benefit as well. So then the Shaykh goes on to say in the next paragraph, he says, قَدْ تَتَثَاقَ لِسِيَامِ لِمَا فِيهِ مِنْ كَبْحْ جِمَاعِهَا جماحها ومنعها من الشهوات والله جل وعلا بين أنه سن أنه سنته في خلقه وأنه على جميع الأمم حتى في الجاهلية كان الصيام معروفا كانوا يسومون يوم عاشوراء. So then the Sheikh says also you know from your own self that that when you're fasting you know it, it, it's a great act. It can be heavy upon you in terms of uh, staying away from desires, right? Uh, so desires that are allowed, you know, like no, like for example, if you're married, you know, having relations with your wife or uh, eating and drinking is not haram, you know, obviously if it's uh, halal, eating halal and drinking halal, yeah? So those are things you, you prevent yourself from what's halal, uh, but you also at the same time prevent yourself from committing sins as well, from that which is haram. So from that point of view, it's it's quite heavy on you and it's a great act of worship. Uh, and then the Sheikh mentions here uh, that Allah has uh, clarified that fasting is the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his creation, that what he, what he orders his creation with, it's something that it's the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his creation, basically. And it, as mentioned in the previous paragraph, that fasting, it came to previous nations as well. So it's well known. And even in uh, in the times of Jahiliya, uh, the, pre, uh, the pre-Islamic ignorance, um, it was well known to those uh, pagan Arabs as well. And that they used to fast the day of Ashura. And the people that came before, they used to fast the day of Ashura as well. Yeah. So then the Sheikh goes on to mention the other part of the ayah that we read, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So the Sheikh is giving us a tafsir here, uh, an explanation of, of, of the ayah that we read. So the Sheikh, he says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ هَذَا بَيَانٌ لِلْحِكْمَةِ مِنَ الصِّيَامِ 
فلعلكم تتقون بيان للحكمة في مشروعية الصيام وهو أنه يسبب التقوى لأن الصيام يترك به الإنسان مألوفته وشهوات وشهوات وشهواته ومألوفاته ومرغوباته تقربا إلى الله سبحانه وتعالى فيكسبه التقوى كما أنه يكسر أيضا شهوة النفس وحدتها أو وحدتها لأن الشيطان يجري من ابن آدم مجرى الدم فما فما تناول شهوات يتسلط الشيطان وما ترك شهوات يضعف مجرى الدم فيت فيطرد الشيطان عن المسلم ففي الصيام حصول التقوى التي هي جماع الخير كله. So then in this paragraph the Sheikh says لعلكم تتاكون. So he, he quotes this uh, uh, end of the ayah that we read originally uh, which means that uh, in a hope that you become pious that in order that you become pious or fasting that you fast in order that you become or attain piety. So the Sheikh says this is uh, this clarifies to us the wisdom of fasting. This is the wisdom of fasting to attain piety. So the Sheikh says, he says here, the wisdom is and the wisdom is to attain piety and also in the uh, uh, the legislature of um, fasting. And and what it brings about is when you fast, it brings about taqwa, the taqwa of Allah. The when you being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you becoming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by way of fulfilling his commands and uh, staying away from that which is prohibited you from and this is then taqwa that you're attaining piety because the shaykh says because fasting you know um, with the person he leaves off when he fasts he leaves off his habits his habitual uh, actions and habits and his desires and his what he wishes for and desires as well, what he wishes for to do. And he leaves all of this in order to become more close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So by way of that, he earns piety and he attains piety. So then the shaykh, he goes on to say, he mentions a different example. He says like, for example, the shaitan, how the shaitan, he... he the shaitan is like, he's closer to you, like, he's close to you, for example, uh, like how your blood rushes through your veins, that's how close to you the shaitan is. In terms of, you know, in tra you know those desires that come, you know, the whispers that you may get, uh, the desires that, you know, do this, do this, you know, be encouraged to do things. However, by fasting, you are leaving off those desires for Allah's sake and by doing that you weaken the shaitan you weaken the plots of the shaitan and you go closer to Allah and further away from what the shaitan wants you to do essentially this is what the shaykh is saying here and the shaykh says here he says that the Muslim in his um, fasting he obtains and attains uh, uh, a taqwa, piety, uh, which brings about all that which is good. So then the Shaykh continues and he says, فَهَذِهِ فَائِدَةُ الصِّيَامِ أَنَّهُ يُسَبِّبَ تَقْوَى تَقْوَى اللَّهِ تَقْوَى اللَّهِ سُبْحَانُ وَتَعَالَى وَاتِّقَاءِ الْمُحَارِمْ وَشَهَوَاتِ الْمُحَرَّمَةِ لِأَنَّ الْإِنسَانَ إذا ترك المباحات طاعة طاعة لله كان من باب أولى أن يترك المحرمات الصيام يدربه على التجنب الحرام ويدربه على التمكن من من نفسه الأمارة أمارة بسوء ويطرد عنه الشيطان ويلين قلبه للطاعة ولذلك تجد الصائم أقرب إلى الخير من المفتر تجده يحرس على تلاوة القرآن وعلى الصلاة ويذهب إلى المسجد مبكرا الصيام 
ليناه للطاعة للطاعة وهذبه كل هذا داخل في قوله لا لكم تتقون. سدان الشيخ يمنشنز هي فجسكو باكو باكو هي. So the benefit of fasting, what is it? As we've learned in the previous paragraph, the Sheikh says the benefit of fasting is that it brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it brings about attaining piety, a taqwa. So it brings about us being more conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whenever we do actions, we, we know Allah is watching us, Allah hears and he sees. And so we're more aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're always checking, okay, I'm doing, going to do this, is it right or wrong? You know, you have that awareness. And so you are, uh, you're more focused on making sure that you execute the commands that Allah has commanded you, commanded you with and you stay away from the prohibitions that he has prohibited you from. Uh, as the wajal. And also that, you know, you, you also stay away there. For, for that reason then, you stay away from all that which is uh, haram, which is forbidden. And you stay away from those desires that are forbidden, you know. Uh, and so this brings about piety then. Then the shaykh says, because if, for example, if a person, because the shaykh says, if a person leaves that which is permissible, if a person leaves off doing something that which is permissible to do for uh, or for the sake of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then from that which is more appropriate to do is that is to leave off what is haram. This is what the Shaykh mentions. And he says that um, fasting, it's, it, it basically it nurtures us and it, it kind of is like an exercise where we we are fasting and we are staying therefore staying away from that which is haram and it helps us to uh, uh, stay away from that which is haram and it makes us more firm in ourselves and controlling our uh, the evil of ourselves it helps you control yourself and it also repels the shaitan and it also the sheikh mentions here and it also softens your heart and it opens your heart up to being more obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for that reason then, you find the one who is fasting, uh, he is more closer to that which is good. When comparing the one who is fasting to the one who is not fasting. He's always always doing more good compared to, uh, generally speaking, compared to the one who is not fasting. And you see him... Uh, uh, with a strong desire upon, for example, reading the Qur'an, he's pushing himself, striving, reading the Qur'an more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and uh, also, you know, praying, uh, and he's going to the masjid early, and you see all of this from him. And so this is what the shaykh mentions here, in terms of taqwa and attaining piety, and that is the, that is the purpose of fasting for you to reach that piety and help you and stay away from that which uh, uh, which is prohibited so then the shaykh continues and he says fashahidu min al ayati qawluhu kutiba alaykum al siyam hada dalilun ala fardi ala ala fardiyat al siyam wa fassarahu bi qawlihi shahr ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al quran li anna qawluhu kutiba alaykum al siyam mujmal فسره بقوله فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم. So then the Sheikh says the point here, the point from the ayah, the speech of Allah, كتب عليكم الصيام. He says that he mentions this ayah and he says that fasting has been obligated upon you, all Muslims has been obligated upon you. He says the Sheikh says this is um, uh, an evidence for the obligation of fasting, and it's explained by the speech of Allah. Where Allah says, uh, "Shahru Ramadan, alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran," that the month of Ramadan, which the Quran was revealed in, because then the Sheikh says, "Li'anna qawlahu," because the speech kutib alaykum al-siyam, that um, fasting has been obligated upon you, is general and it's been explained by the speech, "Faman shahida minkum al-shahra fal So whoever witnesses 
the starting of the month, i.e. the month of Ramadan, then he should fast it. As we're all aware of this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, is a longer, you can go back and have a look at verse 185 and refer to that for more details. So then the Shaykh moves on to a point 41 here and he says, Idda'a al-Yahud annahum muslimun wa annahum ala deeni Ibrahim famtahinahum Allah jalla wa ala fi hadhi al-aya wa qala wa lillahi ala al-nasi hijju al-bayti man istata'a ilayhi sabila wa man kafara fa inna Allah ghaniyun an al-alamin fa in kuntum muslimina fa hajju fa hujju li anna Allah farada hajj al-bayt ala al-muslimin فَإِذَا لَمْ تَحُجُّوا وَأَبَيْتُمُ الْحَجَّ فَهَذَا دَلِيلٌ عَلَىٰ أَنَّكُمْ لَسْتُمْ مُسْلِمِينَ وَلَسْتُمْ عَلَىٰ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمٍ وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ So then, the Shaykh, he mentions, he moves on to point 41, now we're moving on to Hajj, the fifth pillar. And the Shaykh, he mentions and he says, that the Jews, they claimed that they are, Muslim, that they are Muslims, that they are Muslimin. And that they are upon the deen of Ibrahim. They claim this. That they are upon the deen of Ibrahim. So then Allah tested them. Allah, Allah Jalla Wala tested them. In this ayah that we just read. And so if we go to the meaning of this ayah. Let me just find it. Give me one second. So let me go. Let me try to find it. Here. Yeah. Give me one second, brothers. Try to find this here. Yeah, here we are. Surah to Ali Imran, verse 97. Verse 97. Let's read the whole ayah. In it are manifest signs, for example, the maqam, place of Ibrahim, Abraham. Whosoever enters it, he attains security. And Hajj, so here's the point we should focus on. And Hajj, pilgrimage to Mecca, to the house of, to the house Kaaba, is a duty that mankind owes to Allah. Those who can afford the expenses for one's conveyance, provisions and residence and whoever disbelieves, i.e. denies Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca, then he is a disbeliever of Allah. Then Allah stands not in need of any of the alameen, mankind and jinns and all that exists. So, um, that's clear to us. And the Shaykh, he mentions this ayah and then he goes on to say, so if you the Jews, if you the Jews were Muslims, Allah challenges them. If you, the Jews, were Muslims, then make the Hajj, make the pilgrimage to Mecca, to the Kaaba. Because Allah has made uh, the pilgrimage to the Kaaba, yeah, the Bayt, the house, an obligation upon every Muslim. So if they don't, if they didn't, so if they don't make that Hajj and they reject the Hajj, for, so this is a clear evidence upon them that they are not Muslims, that they are not in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are not from the uh, people of Ibrahim alayhi salam, they are not from those who follow the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam and then the last part of the ayah that we read the meaning if you remember the Shaykh mentions again, he mentions here وَمَنْ كَفْرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيُّنَ الْعَلَامِينَ yeah so then, uh, whoever disbelieves, uh, uh, or um, and whoever disbelieves in the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, then he's a disbeliever. Then Allah stands not in need of any of the alamin, right? So the Shaykh continues and he says he breaks this down now. So he's going to use the tafsir of the ayah. So he says, "Walillahi, ay hada fardun wa haqqum wa wajibun lillahi subhanahu wa taala ala nas." So walillah for Allah it means here that it's 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 an obligation that Allah has put upon us for us to carry out for him. Yep. And Hajj, we all know what Hajj is. And the Shaykh gives us an extra benefit here. He says in the in the linguistic meaning of Hajj, it means al qast um uh intention. That's probably the best word to use, intention. And the, the, remember, there's always a linguistic meaning and there's a legislative meaning, yeah? So make sure you always know the both. 
So we know the first one, the linguistic meaning is intention, for example. Then the Sheikh says Al Hajj Sharan. Then Al Hajj uh, in the legislative meaning, he says, he says, Tasdul Kaaba Al Musharrafa Wal Mashair Al Muqaddasa Fi Waqtin Maksus Fi Ada Ibadat Maksusa Wahiya Manasik Al Hajj. So the Sheikh says, it's the intention of the noble Kaaba and those uh, 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 signs um, that are uh, um, uh, that are, uh, are part of the Hajj in a specific time to carry out specific types of worship and the rites of Hajj. That's what it means. And then the Sheikh says, what does uh, Hijjul Bayt mean then? Hijjul Bayt. He says, i.e. Al-Ka'ba wa ma hawlaha min al-mashair tabi' laha. So Hijjul Bayt, or making pilgrimage to the house, what does it mean? He says, i.e. the Ka'ba, Al-Ka'ba, and that which is around it, and that which is secondary to it. Yeah. So like, you know, Safa, Marwa, etc. Yeah, all parts of the rites of Hajj. So then the Sheikh continues and he says, the last, the last part he says, Man istata ilayhi sabila. And he says, Man istata ilayhi sabila. Hada bayanun, hada bayanun shart al wujubi wa huwa al istita'at al badaniya wa al istita'at al maliya. So then when it comes to Hajj, as we're aware, and most of us are aware, that one of the uh, uh, conditions is that you are capable. Hajj becomes uh, obligatory upon us um, when we're capable. Capable of what? Capable of carrying it out with our bodies. So in good health, strength, able to carry out the rites of Hajj. And secondly, the ableness in terms of uh, in terms of uh, monetary, you know, wealth. In terms of wealth. So these are the two things. And the Sheikh, he says, this is the condition. It's obligated and it is to do with Capability, bodily capability and monetary capability, and um, he says here al istitaat al badaniya bi an yakuna qadran al mashi al mashi wa rukub wa linkit wa intiqal min baladihi ila Makkah fi ayi makan min al ard. Adi al badaniya. Yakhruj lajiz ajzan mustamiran kal marid maradan muzminan wal kabir al haram. فَهَذَا لَيْسَ عِنْدَهُ إِسْتِطَاعَةَ بَدْنِيَةٍ فَإِنْ كَانَتْ عِنْدَهُ إِسْتِطَاعَةٌ مَالِيَةٌ فَإِنَّهُ يَنِيبُ أَوْ يُنِيبُ مَنْ مَنْ يَحُجُّ عَنْهُ حَجَّةَ الْإِسْلَامِ حَجَّةَ الْإِسْلَامِ So then the Shaykh mentions here what we briefly mentioned, he mentions in more detail. He says, so as for um, uh, the bodily capability, then that is that the person is capable of walking, um, you know, being able to take a bus, being able to fly, you know, uh, modes of transport and be able to uh, um, uh, um, uh, travel and move from one place to another place. So, for example, from Bedis and get to uh, Makkah, for example, uh, or in any other place that he requires him to be and to carry out the Hajj. So it goes, for example, if somebody was incapable, Ajiz, somebody was incapable, uh, and he's upon this um, uh, incapability, because let's just use a simple example, as we'll all be able to uh, relate to, is, for example, somebody who has a, a chronic disease, for example, might have very, very bad diabetes or some other kind of disease, which doesn't uh, allow them to move around easily, for example, uh, or uh, etc. As, as an example, or old age as a disease, an old, old age, um, then this person isn't classed as being uh, b uh, capable in terms of their body, you know, being able to get to places, do things, uh, and carry out the actual Hajj itself. Uh, so then this person, if he's ill in this example, the Sheikh gave, uh, then is not capable, is not capable, and therefore uh, uh, is better for him then. Uh, he basically uh, um, asks somebody else to go in his place and carry out the Hajj. Yep. Then the Sheikh he continues and he says, "Amal istitaatu al maliyatu fahiya tuwafr al markab al ladi yunqiluhu 
الراحلة أو السيارة أو الطيارة أو الباخرة كل وقت بحسبه ويكون عنده مال يستطيع أن يوفر له المركب الذي يمتطيه في أداء الحج وأيضا الزاد يكون عنده زاد ونفق ونفقه ونفق له في السفر ذهابا وإيابا لمن يمونهم يكون عندهم كفايتهم عندهم كفايتهم إلى أن يرجع إليهم فالزاد معناه أن يكون عنده ما يكفيه في سفره ويكفي من يمونه من أولاده ووالديه وزوجته وكل من تزمه نفقته يؤمن لهم يؤمن لهم ما يكفيهم حتى يرجع حتى يرجع إليهم بعد تأمين السداد الديون إن كان عليه ديون يكون هذا المال فاضلا بعد سداد الديون فإذا توفر هذا فيكون هذا هو السبيل الزاد والراحلة كما في حديث ابن مباس رضي الله عنهما ومن لم يستطيع يستطع أي من من ليس عنده زاد ولا راحلة فليس عليه حاجة لأنه غير مستطع فشرط فشرط وجوب الحج هو الاستطاعة. So this is quite a long one. So let's just stop there for a second. So then the sheikh says as for the capability that's related to uh, uh, your wealth, for example, then then you have to make available, then from your wealth, it has to be made available um, uh, for you to be able to travel, for example, uh, whether that's a car, whether that's by sea, boat, uh, ferry, wh whatever, a ship, a plane, um, etc. Uh, and, you know, being able to travel and have the necessary uh, uh, means to travel, etc. And have the wealth for that, to do that. So therefore, there's, uh, he has plenty of wealth to be able to do these things and carry them out, etc. And he's able to then carry out Hajj by way of that. Also, that he has to have provisions. He has to have some kind of provisions and savings. So that he's, he, that, for example, he's got enough to travel with and has money that he can take with him and wealth that he's able to travel and carry out all that is required of Hajj, for example. Also, the people that he provides for, for example, back home, that is left, for example, that he leaves with them, that which is sufficient for them, open till he returns to them, for example, etc. So, you know, for the people who rely upon him, whether that is his wife, his kids, maybe his parents, perhaps, and others, yeah, from the family may rely upon him. So, therefore, he needs to make sure that he leaves that which is sufficient for them, open till he returns. So all of this comes into this uh, monetary or uh, capability, um, and also with regards to um, ensuring um, um, uh, ensuring uh, if any if he has any debts that he ensures or ensures that, uh, that there is sufficient money to pay off those debts. For example, yeah. So it mentions here ilayhim ba'da ta'min sadad ad duyun. إن كان عليه ديون. Yeah, so it mentions it. And then the, the Sheikh says, يكون هذا المال فاضلا بعد سداد الديون. So then he mentions these examples. Um, and then he mentions as as which you find in the hadith of Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنهما. Uh, so, so a person, if he can't, for example, if he's not able to do this from, from a monetary point of view, um, then, then he's not capable as well uh, from a monetary standpoint and therefore he's not met the condition. But we, we all understand this anyway, alhamdulillah, um, that you need to be financially capable of, uh, and you need to be capable in terms of uh, your body and health so you can carry out uh, the minimum that's required from you to complete the Hajj. So then the Sheikh, he continues and he says, وَلَمَّا كَانَ الْحَجْ يُؤْتَى إِلَيْهِ مِنْ بَعِيدٍ مِنْ كُلِّ أَقْتَارِ الْأَرْضِ من كل فج عميق ويحتاج إلى مؤنة وفيه مشقة وتعب وقد يحصل فيه أخطار فمن, فمن رحمة الله أن 
جعله في الأم في الأمر مرة واحدة وما زاد عليها فهو تطوع هذا من رحمة الله سبحانه وتعالى حيث لم يوجب حيث لم يوجبه على المسلم على المسلم كل سنة كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الله فرض عليكم الحج فحجوا قال الأق الأقرع بن حابس رضي الله عنه أكل سنة يا رسول الله فسكت عنه الرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ثم عاد السؤال فسكت عنه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ثم عاد السؤال فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لو قلت نعم لو جاء لو لا لو لو جبت ولم ولم ما استطعتم الحج مرة واحدة فما زاد فهو تطوع هذا من رحمة الله. So then um, the Sheikh mentions here in this long paragraph that you know when Hajj was uh, obligated um, and that we know that when Hajj people come, the people when you know the Hujjaj, the pilgrims, they come from all areas all over the world. Right from all over the world, they come to Mecca and to make Hajj. And so he mentions that you know there's a person requires you know provisions and you know etc. It also requires, for example, uh, you know what's required of him or what the person goes through is tiredness and difficulty. Um, and also from that, there are some, for example, um, dangers. So from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he made it in, a, in a once in a lifetime. The hajj is a once in a lifetime obligation. And if you do more than one hajj, if you do more than one pilgrimage after you've done the first one, then it is like a, a supererogatory. It's like it's, it's a supererogatory. It's additional. So the minimum is one. If you want to do more, no problem. But only one is required of you. Any more than that, it's supererogatory. It's additional. And you get extra reward for that, of course, for whoever can do it and is capable. But the minimum, if you meet the conditions, as mentioned in the previous paragraph, then the Shaykh says, Hafizullah says, it is required from every Muslim who meets the conditions just once in his lifetime, his, his or her's lifetime. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he said that indeed Allah has obligated upon us, upon you, Al-Hajj, the pilgrimage to the house, so perform the Hajj. So then a Sahabi, Al-Aqra ibn Habis, radiallahu anhu, he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, is it every year, Ya Rasulullah, he said to him at that time, he said, is it every year? So then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remained quiet, he didn't answer, he remained quiet. And then he asked again, and the Prophet ﷺ remained quiet. And then he asked again, and then the Prophet ﷺ basically said to him that the Hajj, in summary, that the Hajj is one time. And anything extra, if you do more than one Hajj, then the second, third, fourth, fifth time after the first time, it is uh, supererogatory, right? And the Shaykh says, this is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then we go on. Okay, I think, just let me just check something. Right, okay, we'll finish here. We've got another two, three minutes and inshallah we'll be finished. So then the Shaykh, he mentions, وَقَوْلُهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ الْعَالَمِينَ And we, we read the meaning of that. So the Shaykh says, فِيهِ دَلِيلٌ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ مَنْ مَنْ امْتَنَعَ عَنِ الْحَجِّ وَهُوَ يَقْذِرُ وَلَمْ يَحُجْ فَإِنَّهُ كَافِرٌ لِأَنَّ اللَّهَ قَالَ وَمَنْ كَفَرْ أي مَنْ أَبَى أَنْ يَحُجَّ وَهُوَ قَادِرٌ عَلَى الْحَجِّ فَإِنَّ هَذَا كُفْرٌ قَدْ يَكُونُ كُفْرًا أَصْغَرْ فَمَنْ تَرَكَهُ جَاحِدًا لِوُجُوبِهِ هَذَا كُفْرٌ أَكْبَرْ بِإِجْمَاعِ المسلمين أما من أما من اعترف بوجوبه وتركه تكاسلا فهذا كفر أصغر ولكن إذا 
توفي وكان له مال فإنه يحج من ترك من تركته لأنه دين عليه لله عز وجل وهذا الآية فيها وجوب الحج وهو ركن من أركان الإسلام وبين الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه ركن من أركان الإسلام في من أركان الإسلام في حديث جبريل وفي حديث ابن عمر. So then the Sheikh he goes on to say that um, in this paragraph the Sheikh says that we read that meaning so whoever disbelieves then indeed Allah is in not need of the Alameen jinn mankind and all that exists. And in it is a, an evidence uh, that the one who uh, does not attend the Hajj does, and he basically prevents himself from attending the Hajj and making the pilgrimage and he is capable and he doesn't perform the Hajj then indeed this person is a kafir, a disbeliever. So the Sheikh doesn't explain this in more detail so we should pay attention. So the Sheikh he says here because Allah said وَمَنْ kafara." So whoever disbelieves, that's what Allah said, i.e. Excuse me, i.e. whoever um, turns away and uh, rejects uh, the Hajj and, he's ob uh, and he is capable upon, upon performing it from the monetary standpoint, from his wealth, that is plenty of wealth, there's enough wealth for him to go and that is, uh, and from his body, that is, is healthy enough to actually go, then this person has, has disbelieved. Yeah? And that is disbelief. So then the Sheikh says, so, so uh, sometimes it's, it's uh, um, the uh, disbelief that is a, is a lesser disbelief. Yeah, because there's a, there's a greater disbelief and there's a lesser disbelief. So it could be that maybe it could be lesser disbelief. So he explains what is lesser, how does it, how is it lesser disbelief? The Sheikh says it is less, lesser disbelief, right? For the one who leaves the Hajj. Uh, so let's just stop there for a second. So then the person, so he mentions it here. We'll just, because he's mentioned a different way, I'll try to make it easier in the English translation. So for example, the, the greater disbelief, the Kufrun Akbar is the person who denies Hajj as an obligation and he knows it and he denies it as an obligation and then doesn't perform it. This person is uh, has committed the Kufr Akbar, the greater disbelief by way of consensus of all the Muslims. However, the one who proclaims and professes that Hajj is an obligation and he leaves the Hajj off because of laziness, for example, laziness, then this person has fallen into the lesser kufr. Then the Sheikh says, however, uh, uh, if he passes away and he has, for example, uh, money to, uh, to uh, carry out the Hajj, and so uh, then he says, man taraktuhu or man taraktuhu liannahu so then obviously that's a dain it's a basically if a person hasn't performed the hajj and he's got the money to do it then uh, then basically it's an obligation for him and it's like a loan like a loan right that is taken with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's a it's a right that he has to perform right so then the shaykh goes uh, go, goes on to say and this is uh, uh, this ayah that we read, that the Sheikh read, uh, that the Sheikh quoted, it shows us the obligation of Hajj, and that it is a pillar from the pillars of Islam, um, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam clarified it as well, that is a, it is a pillar from the pillars of Islam, in the Hadith of Jibreel, the famous Hadith, if you uh, find a book called uh, um, al Arba'in and Nawawiya, the 40 Hadith of Nawawi, you'll find it there, I think it's the first, second or third Hadith, I believe it's the third Hadith, You'll find it there. It is a famous hadith. It's called the Hadith of Jibreel. Uh, and I think we'll go through it as well in the next lesson when we talk about Iman because it covers it covers the main three levels which we did actually in a previous lesson as well. The main three levels. 
of Islam, Al Islam, Al Iman, and Al Ihsan. Yeah. So, um, the Hadith Jibril is no, is known as Hadith Jibril, famous Hadith. Okay, well known. So the Sheikh goes and say, "Wakad far for the Hajj, fi sana ti tasya ala qaul, wa lam yahujj Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fi hadi sana, wa inna ma Hajj fi sana ti lati baadha fi sana ti alashra." لماذا؟ لأنه صلى الله عليه وسلم أرسل عليا ينادي في الناس في المو في الموسم أن لا يحج بعد هذا العام مشرك ولا يت ولا يتوف بالبيت عريان. فلما منع المشركون ومن المشركون والعورات من الحج في العام على عشر حج النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم حجة الوداع. so Final paragraph now, we'll finish here, inshallah. So then the Shaykh goes on to say, so therefore, um, the uh, Hajj was obligated, Hajj was obligated in the uh, ninth year after the Hijrah. Ninth year after the Hijrah. But the Prophet ﷺ did not perform the Hajj uh, in that year, sallallahu alayhi wa He didn't perform in that year, and indeed, he performed it uh, in the year that came after it, which was the, the year 10 after Hijrah. Why? The Sheikh says, why? And we, we all would ask that question. Why didn't he do it? Why didn't he perform the Hajj in the ninth year? And why in the 10th year? So the Sheikh says, uh, the Prophet, uh, Prophet uh, didn't perform it except in the 10th year. Why? And he sent Ali, uh, radiallahu anhu, to call the people uh, in in uh, in the season, in terms of the season of Hajj. And he told him, he said, uh, and and he and he told him to tell the people to call and say to them that uh, that 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 uh, there won't be a Hajj after the uh, there won't be a Hajj, yeah. So there won't be a Hajj a pilgrimage uh, after this year for any Mushrik, any polytheist, uh, and uh, and no person will um, uh, circumambulate the Kaaba naked. He said this. So when the polytheists were prevented and were blocked, for, uh, and the and the people uh, uh, who uh, went around the Kaaba naked, succumbing, were blocked from performing the pilgrimage, it was in the in the tenth year that they were blocked here. This was the last time they were from the tenth year onwards. No polytheist or anybody naked can go to the Hajj. Basically, it's for the Muslims only, and this is the tenth year. Which that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he performed his Hajj on the tenth year, um, uh, uh, and this is the reason behind it. And this was the uh, final uh, uh, the Hajj uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah. So uh, that's explanation from the uh, Sheikh Fawz uh, Allah. And so we'll stop here, uh, inshallah, and uh, we'll a uh, good place to stop here because we're starting a new topic, which is. Um, we're discussing the se second level now and we're talking about Al-Iman. So we're going to talk about Al-Iman. The Sheikh is going to explain that to us in more detail. And so we'll continue that next week. Barakallahu feekum. Inshallah. I'll see you brothers uh, next week. Uh, same time. Uh, it may be 8 o'clock next week. So just bear that in mind. I might change the time to uh, uh, 8 p.m. Inshallah. 15 minutes earlier than usual. Um, just because the time's changing now. And it might be better just to do it a little bit earlier. Uh, if anybody has any problems with the timing, please let me know. Otherwise, inshallah, we'll see you next week. Barakallahu feekum. Subhanakullahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa tubi ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.